that's a Kagame kind of question. <laughs> or because when I was six years old, I lost my parents, both my parents. And, uh, and to be honest, that didn't come from any schooling, any. So it came from just wanting to be better and at it myself. Yeah. But of course, as an international cup, there are still challenges also, given that uh, it is still considered uh, uh, something outside the norm to sort of marry uh, a foreigner that doesn't look like you or... Africa. Wonderful peoples, so I'm officially starting to get bored. We are still in partial lockdown over here. Gyms and bars are still closed and we can only move around until 8 p.m. Anyway, a few days ago, I had a special chat slash interview with a very special guy here at Vision City. He is a successful Rwandan entrepreneur, CEO, and young father in the prime of his life. This guy, single-handedly saved my entire business. I would donate a kidney to him right now if he needed one, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But before I introduce him to you, I would like to remind you, if you like my videos or you like my guest today, please like the video and subscribe by hitting that red button and that bell icon. It really helps and motivates me to make more videos like these. And also, you can get more information about my guest from his own social medias linked below. Give me a follow on Instagram and Twitter. Say hi from Theo. Hello, wonderful people. Welcome back to Theo's Back. So in today's interview, we have Ivan. Um, I'm just going to let him introduce himself real quick. Uh, my name is Ivan Munyengango. Uh -huh. Well, but many people call me Ivan, and I will also accept to be called Ivan for many reasons. Uh -huh. um, um, what, what it is that I do, I am a professional fitness trainer in Rwanda. Where did we meet? Was like, I don't know, you came by the gym maybe? I don't know. Yeah, but even before that, because I'd, I'd seen you, maybe Piri Piri. I met Ivan randomly at a bar last year after I had moved to Rwanda. During that time, I had a partnership going on with two other young Rwandans where I gave them my gym equipment to use and they gave me space in their gym. That went well for about a month and a half or so until their business started failing and they had to close doors. That meant I had to abruptly move out of that facility as well. But I had no money and I did not know where to bring my clients to. I was sad and desperate at that point and I was honestly ready to give up. Luckily, I knew Ivan had the gym also, so I went to his gym just to seek guidance and ask for maybe a potential partnership. And that is when this guy said one thing that changed my entire business. He said, we don't quit here. And I was like, hmm. Without really knowing me, Ivan took my business under his wing so it could grow and flourish and one day be able to stand on its own feet. So that's what happened. I eventually moved my equipment to his gym and that's how our beautiful partnership started growing. You know, the surprise of meeting someone like Ivan who, who you can work with, who can strategize, who you can you basically have a long-term goal together it's like kind of unique it's a very it's a very unique circumstance which makes Ivan a very unique person over the past year or so that I've known Ivan I found him to be a very unique character he's very humble and hardworking and has a very big heart personally he interests me because he's also such a down-to-earth guy who was born and raised right here in Rwanda unlike me as a diaspora Rwandan myself I was born in Rwanda but I grew up in the Netherlands for the last 20 years. Throughout my life, I've met many diaspora Rwandans like me and I know many of their stories of moving to different countries, learning a new language, navigating through all these new societies, and of course, experiencing racism along the way. But stories that I never heard when I was growing up were stories of young Rwandans like Ivan, who stayed and grew up in Rwanda after the 1994 genocide. In this episode, we talk about Ivan's life growing up in Rwanda after the genocide against the Tutsis where he lost both his parents. How he grew up separated from his siblings and making through the educational system of that time. Despite all that he has been through, Ivan has been able to turn his passion of sports and training into a successful business. 
and he has worked himself up to be now the CEO of Kali Fitness Rwanda, one of the premier gyms right here in Chigali. At the end, we will dive into his personal life and he will tell us why he fell so hard for his Danish lady, with whom he has a lovely family, living right here in beautiful Chigali. My round of peoples, please enjoy this chill, laid-back chat slash interview slash podcast with my brother from another mother. Just for my own curiosity, um, how was it being like raised, let's say from primary here in Rwanda, like how was your upbringing, how was life for you? Um, you know, in those early years? I can say I had a very normal, like you said, uh, Rwandan upbringing. Mm -hmm. And um, what it was like to grow up as, 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 as a kid, as a young boy in Rwanda is that... Um, um, Did you grow up with both your parents? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what's... Uh, spicy <laughs> that's yeah, yeah that's what's spicy in, in 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 my life i feel because when i was six years old i lost my parents both my parents and uh that made it um not so it's not like a it's not like a special situation because i know there are many people in this situation yeah but um it, it's also not so common to lose parents when you are six so um yeah, a man had to grow inside of me, even yeah. if uh, at every stage of my growth, even if I looked so young, uh, I had to mom and dad myself for so long. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, you have two sisters? Yes, and, and a brother. And a brother? Yeah. And you are the uh, third? I yeah. am in the middle, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, the third. So you're like the oldest male... In the, us, yeah, yeah. In the, and did that also bring that yeah. kind of like expectation for you to man up in, within the family? Yeah, when yeah, I would say yeah. There is that uh, uh, societal pressure of the oldest man in the in the in the house. Yes. Uh, it doesn't matter how old you are. You see kids who have ruled countries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, just because they are males. Uh, yeah, in, a, in that's what you get in a patriarchal world we live in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but for you, you took on that role, or did it come in? with some kind of like difficulties um, to adjust or to maybe to step into No, what shoes. happened was that um, it's actually that it's not, it's not like we grew up all together. Yeah. So um, I think they are, they're going to, I don't know, kill me for this, but I don't think we are very, very close as siblings. Yeah. And one of the reasons is that we never really grew up in the, under the same roof uh, since we were six. Okay. So since I was six. Yeah. So... So we all grew up separately in different um, homes and uh, that makes it really hard to sort of uh, bond when we are grown-ups. It's, it's not, yeah. yeah. What we, you didn't have as kids, mm -hmm. it's not easy to sort of fake or to yeah. cultivate when you're, when you're already hard uh, and, yeah. and grown in life. No, but what, what you're saying um, sounds very familiar, I think, especially with most uh, Rwandans who yeah. grew up um, uh, abroad. You grew up in different homes. Um, I know many stories of, of, of the diaspora Rwandans who grew up in different countries. Yeah. I know one particular, particular good friend of mine, she grew up in the Netherlands, but yeah. her sister is in France, yeah. two brothers are in Canada. Yeah. Um, so, yes, that really makes sense in a way that you are um, prescribing it. So. Would you say like you grew up like within like it's like an official foster care because I'm not really known with the with how you grew up or was it like more you went to, with Auntie you know Celestine and you went with Uncle Tom or how? Well, yeah. What happened was that of course after the genocide there was um, the first uh, step was to sort of um, find each other because even us the four people were not together. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, of course there was the power of some grown ups in our lives at that time. Yeah. So that sort of made it happen. So we we reconnect. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I don't remember personally where a family of those who were uh, who survived uh, who, where they sat and then say what do we do with these kids. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know if it happened organically where like one said, I'm going to take this kid. Another one said, another aunt said, I will take this kid. Yeah. But I, I ended up with uh, my uncle who yeah. had returned from um, uh, Burundi mm -hmm. um, to only to find um, his uh, sister and uh, uh, family uh, all dead. Yeah. So we were like the very close, uh, the only very close people he had left. So he took me in and, uh, and my brother. Uh -huh. So... Um, 
And your two sisters went with someone else? And my two sisters went with someone else, yeah. Okay. But also, uh, later on, uh, fast forward, my brother also had to be in another family. Okay. So I, I can say I grew up with that uncle for... for so then yeah, eventually... Yeah. And then I went into another family as well because he kept having these international jobs uh -huh. that required him to move uh, out of Rwanda. He worked for um, uh, FAO, uh -huh. um, International Food Organization, I think. Um, and yeah... In '98, uh, during the um, uh, Sarajevo issues, like there was a, a, a war in um, Bosnia, and uh, so he was he was placed there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how I gained another family of uh, my um, uh, a cousin to my mom. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, indeed, your upbringing is indeed very different from what I, at least from what I know from the, you know, the diaspora Rwandans. And it's also a story for me personally that has become very interesting because, uh, like I said, I grew up in the diaspora and I know many of the diaspora struggles, yeah. but I know very little indeed of what happened with the Rwandans who stayed in Rwanda yeah. and how the disbursement went and how, you know, of course, the whole rebuilding actually to the moment when they said Rwanda is not totally peaceful. Yeah. I mean, that means before that, it was not that peaceful. Um, fast forwarding to, let's say, your adolescence, when you're like 15, 16, 17, you know, those crucial years of, uh, you know, of growing up as a man. Yeah. How was it for you? Like, was it like easy or was it just something maybe you, because of the circumstances that made you put, put it off away to be like a rebellious teenager? Oh, well, no, but yeah, if, if I've ever was uh, rebellious, which, yeah. which, which I think I was, um, it, it has something to do with, uh, um, I had a very uh, a beautiful family, an amazing family that, uh, that helped raising me and uh, uh, a big part of my life is, is because of them. Yeah. Um, but, um, it, but eventually, of course, there's who I am uh, to the core that always seeking for a bigger space to sort of expand, to sort of uh, uh, grow. Yeah. So I finished uh, high school and then um, I think that gave me a little bit of, um, uh, of course, with the age also, with that big milestone, you feel like uh, not really that you're enough to take care of yourself, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, I felt like the setting in which um, uh, I was in uh, wasn't allowing me to sort of um, expand it the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's uh, when I remembered exactly, I think, the day and the time when I left home without an idea of what I'm going to do uh, uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. But of course, I had a couple of leads um, from living with a friend first and then to find to landing a job and then to... Yeah. Very, I remember that first job, and then um, my first year in college, because I had a fully funded scholarship. Yeah, um, I went to KIST. What does KIST stand for? KIST stands for Kigali Institute of Science and Technology. Yeah. Yes, I hear it a lot, but I, <laughs> yeah, I never knew. Okay, yes, continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a, it, at that time it used now that it's blended with other universities, with other institutions. It's. Mm -hmm. Um, not out there anymore, but it used to be very popular that we take for granted that many people don't even know what it means, but we, we just used to say Yeah, this. exactly. People just yeah. throw it out there and I've, I've never been there, so for me it was always kind of like, I knew it as kissed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what happened is that, yeah, I landed my first job and I was in my first year college. Yeah. And um, it was kind of, um, it's not like I... On a daily basis, I had to put a lot of effort to, to sort of make ends meet yeah. because I lived a very comfortable, easy, one-man life uh, and, for many years. Um, so it was like fully funded by, by, by the Rwandan government? Or by the scholarship, yeah. Yeah? And what did you study? Computer Engineering and Information Technology. That's, that's a faculty. That's a faculty. Yeah. Okay, we got it. Yeah. Um, um, so now you're in your college years, you are, let's say you are at the end, you are like almost finishing. Like how was the transition from coming from, you know, finishing your studies, yeah. you know, and then going into a, a full yeah, profession? Yeah. Uh, Fast forward, it's not like I was waiting for me to get a degree to get a job or to live a normal life where mm -hmm. uh, like the, the usual uh, sort of... Um, the security that everybody is looking for out there, the things yeah. that you know that work. You you go, you work, you get mm -hmm. a degree, you you look for a job, yeah. You get a raise, or yeah. So I remember already in my first year, I I, I was working at um, at um, 
um, a Serena teaching a class mm -hmm. part time as a, as a as a as an instructor. As an instructor. Yeah, yeah. How did you get to be an instructor? So I, ha, huh, how I got into fitness. Yes. So that's already another story. So simultaneously, of course, you don't just do school or other things. There yeah. are also other things you're doing. Uh, um, that aligns with that. As you get time, I was going to gyms. I went to Novotel personally for training a lot. I was running. I picked up uh, a lot of sports. Mm -hmm. I played football. Yeah. So I lived a pretty active life as a teenager. Like okay. I was in my uh, in a in a school team of every school I've ever been to. Okay. Playing football. So, and then. Um, uh, from that, I, I think I picked up the passion. I, I sort of, it's not like I knew that I want to be a professional fitness trainer, but uh, uh, the, the love of it made me um, want to sort of um, cultivate it and, 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 and get more out of it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Fitness is usually one of those things that is driven by, by passion more than credentials of, uh, of, you know, of um, anything else. Okay, so then that's when you, 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 once you finish your studies, you want to pivot more into the fitness world. Um, uh, let, me, let me just put it that way. Uh, how did you get from that point when you're like, you know, you're starting as a trainer at a novel hotel, you know, teaching a class? Not a novel hotel. Yeah, well, there is a whole story to that. Yeah. So how I started was, um, I think it's not very different from how other people are, tr are starting right now, the, the young trainers that you're, uh, you see at the gyms. Um, it starts with uh, you putting in work for yourself mm -hmm. without an idea of where that's going to lead. Yeah. Probably you feel like it's for personal care. Yeah. But then um, I remember being interested uh, by the science in it and what goes into the muscles and how it works for to grow it because uh, uh, you could also, I could only define fitness from, my, from the highest of the understanding I had at that time. Yeah. So I remember being um, an online subscriber of Men's Health because they won't ship here. Mm -hmm. So I got a copy of Men's Health for four years uh, into my email. Okay. And um, I would read about uh, eating and exercise just for me to use at the gym, not to help others. Yeah. But um, things started becoming a bit interesting when I would be, because I'm interested, the whole thing uh, with becoming a, a trainer, you have to have the passion. Mm -hmm. And mainly the passion uh, uh, to help others. Yes. So then um, I started sort of being interested in how other people train. If there is something I, if there are like cues I could give on a squat or on a deadlift or on any lift, mm -hmm. I could like, approach, hey, uh, I think if you corrected this and then do this, uh, your lift will be better and then therefore the benefits will be mm -hmm. optimal. And people loved that, loved uh, free coaching, free advice, free yeah. uh, from somebody who sounded like they know what they are talking about. Okay. And, and, and to be honest, that didn't come from any schooling, any, so it came from searching on the internet hours of, 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 of that, just wanting to be better and, and at it myself. Yeah. To a uh, point, um, I think it got, um, I was training at the stadium, I remember, where two women um, sort of, I would like uh, correct what they were doing, they liked it, and then they asked me like, are you coming tomorrow? Yeah, then I'll be like, yes, I'm coming tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I started aligning my training hours with their training hours, Yeah, uh, because they liked my help. Yes. And then, uh, um, that's 2010, mm -hmm. they uh, started sort of tipping me, or I don't know how they called it, but it was like some form of motivation. Yeah. Like after a session, they would like give me 5,000. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who goes to school, who has like uh, a small bursary to, to live, uh, 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 that was like an extra kind of, uh, it was a motivation, I would say, yeah. for somebody who didn't have money. Mm -hmm. So then um, it started being a serious thing where I'm like, oh, when are you coming tomorrow? Or when then, because there was now like an extra motivation yeah. for me to do, I would even step on and then ask them when they will come. So then, um, yeah, I remember doing all kinds of things for free to learn, to, to learn how to communicate to people. Yeah. And um, 
uh, later on, I loved it enough to sort of uh, invest into education. And then I went on to get a degree, I mean, to get a certificate. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I think the confidence came when I felt like now that I'm a certified fitness trainer, I can call my first person a client because at that time I never really, before then I never really, I could not take you, train you, and then feel like I had a client. Yeah. Although you could like give me 5,000 or, or I don't know how much for transport or whatever as a young uh, uh, trainer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but um, I remember, yeah, feeling confident that now I have a client. So, mm. and I remember my first clients by name, by <laughs> everything. Yeah, yeah. And also so, special people. Yeah. And fast forward to many years later, um, now you are, yeah, let's call you like the CEO of um, Kali Fitness, like one of the premier gyms here in Chigali. So somewhere, somehow along the way, your hard work did get noticed and it did pay off to the fact that where you are like in this position, we are even kind of like overseeing other personal trainers. Yeah. Um, like real quick, how did you... Like how, how, where did that path like start and how did you get to be in this position where you are right now? Um, well, I fast forward from, from um, moving places to places. I found a place I could call home and that's Curry Fitness, of course. Yes. Um, I remember being introduced, uh, introduced by uh, a guy called uh, Pieter, who is actually Dutch. Yeah. Uh, Pieter... Um, Called, uh, we were at uh, at a dinner in Kiev somewhere, and then uh, he was like, "Ah, there are these guys. Um, they're actually setting up a gym." Uh, because my, of course, if everyone asked me what I do, what I did at that time, my my professional introduction was like was that I'm a professional fitness uh, trainer. Yeah. So he was like, "Ah, okay. I have friends. He introduced me to people who were setting up a gym. It was two brothers, mm -hmm. one called Dan, and another one called Alid, mm -hmm. who set up." Um, Kali Fitness, and uh, I remember after set, uh, setting up a meeting with them, we had a talk, and uh, basically I was involved in the setup uh, from ground up oh, of, really? of, of Kali Fitness, mm -hmm. and um, that may, I think, gained me a lot of trust, and uh, they treated me like a brother. We sort of uh, started working together like that, mm -hmm. uh, but still as an independent personal trainer, and they were the gym owners. But so you so, were one, one of their first real personal trainers work in their gym then from the yes. ground up yeah okay yeah oh interesting yeah so so from there on you build just your, yourself uh, how did you get from being one of the independent trainers to the um, uh, in the on the floor yeah. to being now the business owner so basically um uh, yeah eventually they would they also want uh, branched out to do other things and uh um for many years i've been like i don't know uh, the personal trainer slash the manager slash i don't know what other positions i had that were not official mm -hmm. so to a point where now um uh, a couple of years back, they um, sort of moved out of Rwanda, mm -hmm. out of them, and uh, there was only uh, nothing left to be uh, done except to sort of take it over. So that's how. Uh, Did they like discuss with you? Because where, where where were they from? They were from Sweden. They were from Sweden. Yeah, yeah. So before they moved, uh, so like, before they moved back to Sweden, did they like discuss with you like, okay, yeah, but we want to move. Are you willing to take over? Oh, how did that process uh, come to be? Um, I, I think, no, the conversation was not, uh, I think, from their side to me. Mm -hmm. I think it was maybe from me to them, sort of um, uh, like presenting my interest in, in, in running the gym. Mm. So, and then um, uh, there were um, discussions um, with, um, I think, if I remember, many people wanting to buy it and other people... I'm interested in it, in doing other things uh, with it. Um, so I, I placed my interest as well. And uh, since I was uh, already in Cali, it seemed like an obvious uh, choice to, to make on their side. Okay. And uh, that's how it ended up. So they ended up just relocating back to Sweden and then leave you the, uh, the business? Yeah. Going into the business, so how was it like the, that first year, let me just put it that way, just, you know? of you in taking over? Were there like friction within the existing uh, members slash employees who were already working there? Or were they just, oh, Ivan, our guy, we know him, so it was like a smoothless 
transition? Transition. I mean, well, it was. I would say it was smooth. And uh, um, myself, I was um, because I, I prior then. Um, um, I, I I was um, you know there is there is I feel like who I am that never changed regardless of whatever um, attributions or titles or anything you can put on my name, mm-hmm. and since um, that is not really gonna change anytime soon I feel um, it's it's always easy to sort of um, um, go directions with with the staff with the team with the uh, without uh, them feeling like there is a, a new sheriff in town or yeah. there is a new there's any of those um, frictions that uh, could have occurred uh, I, I don't I remember hosting a, a staff meeting mm-hmm. and um, uh, ten, it was just to announce them like yeah, yeah. Uh, to announce the the, the, the new changes and uh, they, they received them really perfectly and everybody was happy because I feel like I have a good relationship with the staff yeah yeah Man, that's a, that's amazing. So now, you know, you've been now, now the CEO of Cali Fitness for uh, how many years? Two, three years now? About to be two years. Yeah. About to be three years. Okay, so moving on to maybe the, the final part. Um, let's talk about, um, let's talk about like life now. You know, now you're like a 30 plus year old man, father, I would say, yeah. um, who's like married and basically living the the random life <laughs> right i would say you are very much in the prime of your adulthood yeah. actually i would even call you like a young adult yeah. uh, you know but because um uh you have a wife uh, rose who i've met a lovely uh, lovely 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 woman um she's danish how did you you know like, like i said you're like a typical random guy who in my appear in my view who's like very typical how did such a typical random guy meet such a foreign girl from Denmark and how did it <laughs> click? Well, people meet, people go out and meet. Yeah, but so like, was it in Rwanda? How, how was it like on vacation? <laughs> uh, was it uh, in the, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, uh, there was this uh, uh, party I went to, a friend of ours. We had a friend in common without knowing, of course. Yeah, it was here in Rwanda? Then, uh, it was here in Rwanda. Uh-huh. So I went to this party and then... Um, pretty late usually it's, it, there are some it's really not not a good thing to go to a party late but i remember it was one of the uh, beautiful things that happened that night is because um i was late and then therefore you get there when a few people when it's no longer crowded yeah so it's easy to spot people and then yeah yeah and also um you, the dancers and and i'm not a good dancer but uh it it made it so easy when they, when there are few people to dance yeah so yeah, it started with a dance. You started with a dance. <laughs> did you ask her or did she come to you? Because I met Rose and she's a very good dancer. So that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, who asked you? I think I asked her. Okay. Yeah. So I think very I typical. asked her. Very typical. Yeah. Or I think it just, yeah. yeah. Uh, she's probably going to kill me, but maybe she asked me. <laughs> so it started with a dance. Very romantic in a way. Um, um, so like I said, because like I've met Rosie, she, like she, to me she looks like a very much, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know much about Danish women, but I know, you know, she looks like a, like a, like a typical white woman, I would say, you know. Um, <laughs> well, <Okay>. yeah, <laughs> like what was the main thing that attracted you to her, in, you know, uh, separate from other women? Um, it was, um, yeah, Rose is a very interesting character, and. Uh, I think obviously the the appearance. So there is the beauty, of course. The, that's the first thing. Mm-hmm. And um, but then the conversations. Like um, I remember scheduling a drink with her, and the interest was not. It's not like I was like, okay, I'm interested in that woman. I wonder where, uh, if I could invite her out or whatever. Yeah. So I remember having a conversation, and in that time, in my head, it wasn't like, okay, this is a girl I would take out or that I like or. It wasn't like that first the first night it wasn't like that yeah but i remember um we talked about um we have these ongoing conversation they they they, they never end about things uh, uh, uh. so th- we have many subjects that we we, we 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 that interest me that also interest her and then we were maybe developing one of them and then um i remember scheduling a drink with her 
the next day mm-hmm. to want to finish a talk that we were having. Oh, it must have been a very interesting talk then yeah, if he did not finish it in so, one evening. <laughs> Papyrus above uh, the restaurant there. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was before it, it dies completely, but yeah, it yeah. was sort of a, a place to be. So yeah. we went there to have a drink yeah. and, um, and, and keep talking. Okay. So, <laughs> so we, we went, we had a drink, um, I think with a pizza. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, we, we went and then I remember not talking to her. We exchanged numbers even uh, the night before mm-hmm. so that we could meet. Um, but I remember like it wasn't like... Um, like I wasn't like I don't know on on her side, but uh, uh, I feel like there was no uh, such a thing as uh, like first fire uh, okay. it, with 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 that. But she was very interesting to talk to, like extre- with like this woman with a brilliant mind with awesome ideas, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, then we 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 obviously said that like, yeah we have to do this again and then we kept doing it we ke- i kept taking her to places like pili pili she would invite me to other places so we developed like a very mm-hmm. like an interest uh in each other from just having uh things that we like to talk about so that yeah 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 no it looks like these conversations uh, got you very far because we eventually got married Yes, and okay. um, and you know, like now, now you are married and you are you have a, a three-year-old daughter. We have a three-year-old a daughter. Three-year-old daughter yeah. together, ah, yeah. and uh, you are living in Rwanda. Um, where did you have a conversation about? Did you like explicitly choose to live in Rwanda, or is it just like a circumstance that made it happen that you guys came to live in Rwanda? Um, we we wanted like personally because I was I feel like. Um, uh, of, of obviously like we all had uh, uh, things like dreams and things we want to do with our professional uh, uh, with our careers and, mm-hmm. and and with our personal developments and um, mine was sort of putting me towards Rwanda still yeah and um, uh, when we met she was still in school and um, she was a PhD candidate at that time so I would I did a fair share of uh, back and forth around mm-hmm. Denmark before then. Yeah. And uh, yeah, until um, I remember when um, uh, we sort of completely decided to relocate to Denmark and, 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 and we all went there, we had a kid. And this uh, was before you were married? When you went to relocate, it was after you got married? It was after I got married. Okay, so yeah. after you got married, you relocated to, to Denmark. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then from then there on, when did you decide? Like, now it's like in during those back and forths before then, we when we, when we were uh, sort of seeing each other, we got yeah. married. Okay. So then, uh, but I was still considering Rwanda as my base, uh-huh. although I kept moving. So mm-hmm. then at some point I was like, okay, enough of this now uh, that she's pregnant. Like that's like a year. Um, uh, that's what's after our marriage. That's a couple of months actually. Okay. So. Then I was like, okay, she's pregnant and she's, she's, she still goes to university to teach. I'll, 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 I'll go, so sort of, she needs my life. Uh, she needs me in her life uh, yeah. now. I'm better useful there than here. Mm-hmm. So um, then I had to now go and sort of feel like uh, Seto-ish. I got a job and, <laughs> and worked at a gym okay. as a trainer. And uh, until, um, fast forward, um, until of course I had to sort of again we had to talk about uh, what it is that we that is working with us. Is it is it there? Is it here? Mm-hmm. Um, and as a as a family, we agreed to to relocate to Rwanda. Okay, now well, that, that that makes it very interesting because um, um, yeah, like I said, for, for especially if for anyone who has uh, who's like Rwandan has lived in uh, in Belgium, uh, like a lot of. Uh, you know, uh, Rwandans there, who are also like a mixed couples, and I think France is even more uh, crazier. Um, my question to you is, how was how was it like being like an interracial couple, like in Denmark, like dating, living together in Denmark, versus here in Rwanda? You know, because um, was there a difference? Or? That's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. So you realize, as an interracial couple, you realize that um, it doesn't matter where, how well you know the country you live in. If it's not your country of origin, mm-hmm. there is still that fair share of, um, there's still that price you pay for being not from there. Okay. 
And um, so she pays it here. And every time I lived in Denmark, I paid it there. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, it could be like um, just uh, a context issue. It could be uh, negotiating with the with a motor guy if you want to go from point A to point B and then all of a sudden you don't know what it is and it could be like those daily qu questions that she asked me when we were in Rwanda about a certain conversation she sort of overheard and what they were talking about and what she thinks like then you uh, it, only when you analyze the, the, the kind of questions uh, you're like okay these are um, uh, questions driven by the culture shock or the cultural difference yeah. But um, you have to know that they, they will uh, continue to exist. So, um, and of course, um, in Rwanda, the, the price I feel like I pay is really less because it's my home mm -hmm. compared to her, to her. But of course, as an international couple, there are still challenges also, given that uh, it is still considered uh, uh, something outside the norm to sort of marry um, a foreigner that doesn't look like you or I mean yeah. the society is not like a hundred percent yeah and, and it's, it's kind of in like alignment because, with that because like Denmark is I would say one of the more progressive European countries out there um, and it's from 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 outside uh, in uh, from outside looking in and Rwanda is one of those countries that I mean for African context at least yeah. it's very progressive run on conservative values sometimes yes yeah sometimes did but it's like you know it's kind of like in front of the class basically in in the in the African context um personally I'm not really familiar with this uh, you know like interracial uh struggles but I do know like one of the things that I heard in the Netherlands back in the days is that um, from my sisters there, when they would see like a black man dating a, a, a white woman, they would almost, almost get angry at the white woman, saying like, "Hey, she's stealing all the good men, <laughs> all the black good men out there." Like, you know, there. Like, have you had any such things uh, yourself in Rwanda? In Rwanda or in yeah, or from other black people uh, in general. From other black people, yeah. I mean, there is like I can, I can definitely there is a little bit of. Um, uh, lack of acceptance in, in, in terms of, and it's not like if you didn't marry the woman you married, it's not like the whole society will marry you at, at all at once or, <laughs> or anything. Yeah. But um, um, you realize that um, uh, it's not quite um, accepted yet, wildly. Wildly. Yeah. As, uh, uh, yeah, the whole, yeah. It doesn't matter who married who. who and just you know, let's let's not talk for Denmark, maybe because we're in, we're in Rwanda. Like for Rwanda, you know, you are in this position. Uh, you know, like lastly, what do you think will be necessary in the coming years to be more accepted? To be, to be like, yeah, it's just a choice. Someone chooses to love this person or this person. That's okay. Like, what well, what's needed for us here Rwandans to progress in that way? Uh, because we're moving as a country, Rwanda is making tremendous strides, economically speaking. Yeah. And therefore, people are going to be less and less consumed by the bullshit. Mm -hmm. So they are going to be busy building their lives and uh, all those little other things, people do them because uh, there's not much happening in their lives, I feel. Yeah. That's, that could be one of the, the, the things. But uh, as, we, as, we, as we move, um, because some of the, 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 the things you hear, like uh, there is a, uh, because uh, unfortunately you still see like these older men from Europe coming to get younger women mm -hmm. in Africa yeah. and in Rwanda. So then you feel like, um, uh, could it be possible also for us to get like a second life in Europe where you like you live a life here and then by the time you're 60, yeah, you, you sort of divorce or whatever, then you go get like a young good-looking uh, European uh, woman. Um, it will be, when you look at the motives, be, be, uh, the drive, things that drive uh, the circumstances or, 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 or things that make it happen that way here in, in, in Africa, mm -hmm. some of it are, are economical. Okay. And that, uh, and, the, and, and, and the other way around may be a bit hard because you find, uh, uh, because it's not the case. Mm -hmm. so, um, so people, uh, moving forward, I would say um, if I'm raising a daughter, I'm raising her to be very independent mm -hmm. 
and to be to make uh, to understand what it is that she's making as choices at every stage of her growth, yeah. so that um, she gets to deal with the consequences of her choices. Mm -hmm. So because um, later on when she's a grown up, uh, because um, uh, you I, you still as a man, if I had um, a young boy as well, I would also raise her to so, raise him to sort of understand that um, there's nothing like independence. Okay. So financially speaking, economically, socially, the more free you are, the better choices you make, I feel. Yeah. So because they are less influenced by any other uh, outside force. Mm -hmm. So you see these uh, marriages that are formed in situations uh, driven by um, other things other than love or other than the will or other than the commitments that the two people have uh, uh, between each other. But as I'm saying, the, Rwanda is, is moving very fast economically and, 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 and in terms of behavioral change, people of course um, are, are changing and seeing things um, uh, differently. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be less and less to, to, for, for people who sort of get together for other reasons other yeah, than exactly. for, uh, love. Uh, so yeah. therefore there will be no mm -hmm. uh, stigma to marry a different race. Mm. Yeah. Now let's hope we get there. Um, well, in closing, we just, we'd just like to get to know like your thoughts of, you know, because like I said, you being a typical Rwandan guy who grew up here mostly and uh, in the prime of your life, where do you see like the uh, Rwanda like developing, you know, like in a few years, let's say a decade from now, in yeah. terms of like, um, you know, business-wise, um, mostly, yeah. and and also just social economic way. Where do I see Rwanda heading? Or yeah, where do you see the, yeah, where do you see Rwanda's uh, development heading in the next ten years? Wow, that's uh, that's gonna be tough to answer. I think that. That that's a Kagame kind of question, or or Ban Ki Moon, or well, who is the new UN guy again? <laughs> the Latin guy, yeah. No, I don't know, but I'll, I'll, the reason why I ask it because I know you're not a politician, yeah. but it is just to get a common voice, someone mm. who is not into that stratosphere, who does not talk that language, mm. just based also on your experience of living here in Rwanda. Yeah. So I, w I would I would say, and I would always use fitness as because it's my area of expertise. Yeah, please. Um, I've, 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 I've watched Rwanda grow in this industry so much in the past 10 years. Yes. And it can kind of give me an idea of where we're headed in the, in the next 10 years from now. Uh -huh. uh, and without a doubt, when you look at the infrastructures that we're putting efforts in, in, into now, be it on uh, self-funded things or on loans or any other uh, means, uh, without a doubt, these are the fundamentals. And yeah. by building from that, we now we start taking care of other things that really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, those are big pillars of a society. So we need, I, I, I can't wait to see Rwanda with like, a, with, a, with like, underground uh, train tracks and, 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 and very efficient public transport and yeah, yeah and, and in 10 years without a doubt we will have all those yeah all right Ivan I thank you very much and I think I speak for my audience as well that this was has been a very insightful conversation personally I've learned so much more about you and about uh, about Rwanda that I did not know um, before um, yeah, I would just say I appreciate you and thank you for all the efforts that you have put in and I hope you keep doing what you're doing. Thank you right. for having me. Voila. Okay. Guys, thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up and please go follow Ivan on his social medias linked below. He's a very interesting guy and I'm very, very thankful for what he has done for me and my business. All right, guys. I would like to see you all in the next video. Muramuche.